Individualized Anatomic ACL Reconstruction, 40 Years of Learning, presented by Dr. Freddy H. Fu. There are no conflicts of interest related to this presentation. Medicine is most effective when we are able to separate fact from fiction. For example, we know the heart has four chambers, four valves, we know its vasculature, and the electrophysiologic pathways. Similarly, in cardiology, we developed the EKG over 100 years ago and have conducted exhaustive studies that have followed thousands of patients over multiple generations. Yet regarding the ACL, we rely on the KT-1000 and published cadaveric studies with eight specimens, clinical studies with just 100 patients, and we only have two to five year follow-ups. True understanding in any field mandates that we first look at and respect the past. We must learn from the mistakes and successes of those who have come before us, and with that knowledge in hand, we can turn and embrace the future. As Dr. Houston famously said, good judgment is based on experience, and experience is based on bad judgment. And though we've done extensive research, we still need to continue learning. We need to understand this crucial definition. The ACL is a dynamic structure, rich in neurovascular supply and comprised of distinct bundles, which function synergistically to facilitate normal knee kinematics in concert with bony morphology. Characterized by individual uniqueness, the ACL is inherently subject to both anatomic and morphological variations, as well as physiologic aging. Studies done at the University of Pittsburgh have shown that the ACL is non-isometric, elongating up to 20% during downhill running. To better understand this anatomy, we have developed a set of principles for anatomic studies. Following visualization of the structures, both in vivo and in vitro testing must follow anatomic positioning and rely on detailed objective measurements. Cut surface modeling of the ACL finds that the shape of the ACL varies with loading conditions and at different flexion angles. The ACL is living. The membrane envelops the ligament, supporting the neurovasculature. This membrane also invests the septum, which is rich in vascular-derived stem cells. The septum divides the ACL into two distinct bundles, the anteromedial and posterolateral bundles. Though we commonly refer to them in biomechanical terms, these bundles are robust biological structures. Though this seems like common sense, this sense only comes from years of careful arthroscopic examination. Here, the hemorrhage indicates blood vessels and accordingly hints at the presence of vascular-derived stem cells. With proper visualization, we can better appreciate rupture patterns. Here, we have partial single bundle ACL tears. On the left, the AM bundle is torn, while on the right, the PL is torn. The principle is to look at anatomy. Everyone asks, what is the technique? But the technique is not important. If you understand anatomy, you will understand the technique. As Paul Galano famously said, look at nature, don't create nature. The best way to look at the ACL is during surgery at 10x magnification. The AM and PL bundles are clearly demarcated with the dividing septum. We are also able to better appreciate the insertion of both bundles and their relation to the menisci. The PL bundle inserts closely with the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus with intermingling of their fibers. Clinical testing reveals the strength of the fibers and their importance to the structural integrity of the ACL and the strength of the PL fibers at this insertion. Biomechanical examination of this anatomy shows changes in orientation with differing degrees of knee flexion. The fibers of the ACL work synergistically to provide anteroposterior and rotational stability of the knee. Five to eight percent of the time, we see single bundle ACL tears. Here, the AM bundle is intact while the PL is torn. Biomechanical studies here at the University of Pittsburgh have also contributed greatly 
to our understanding of knee kinematics and insight to forces on knee structures. These landmark studies showed that anatomic ACL reconstruction better restores native knee kinematics and ACL insight to forces. The non-anatomic graft experiences less forces with the distribution of the forces to the rest of the joint, including the condyle and menisci, leading to abnormal kinematics. Proper understanding focuses on the interplay between bone and ligament morphology. As the bones vary, so do the ligaments. On the left, the ACL is flatter, in the middle, more robust, and on the right, the narrow notch associated with a thinner ACL. Through the work of Dr. Owen Lovejoy, we know that even over 3.2 million years ago, our ancestors were well on their way to developing our current anatomic characteristics. In anthropology, the study of their bony morphology allows us to gain insight into their function and behaviors. Modern comparative anatomy similarly allows correlation of ligament structures with bone morphology. Exam under anesthesia of Johnny the Mandrill revealed AP stability, but significant knee joint laxity. However, arthroscopy revealed an intact three-bundle ACL. This cursory examination begged the question, can excessive laxity be the result of bony morphology rather than ACL pathology? Cadaveric analysis of humans and gorillas revealed great variation in their bony and ligamentous anatomy, with gorillas having a three-bundle ACL. Closer examination of bone morphology reveals that the gorilla has a large medial femoral condyle, allowing for significant motion on the medial side. Comparatively, the average internal rotation of a human knee is 9 to 27 degrees. The notch is also important to think about. Classically, notch plasties were used to improve visualization of the femoral footprint. This made every notch the same, making every ACL reconstruction the same. However, these notches can regrow. Notch plasty is a one-size-fits-all surgery that does not account for individual variation. For example, on the left, an attempt was made to place a 10mm BTB graft anatomically in an 11mm notch which failed twice. However, as seen on the right, higher notches are more accommodated. Examination of the shape of the ACL using precise laser scans found that the isthmus of the ACL is typically 35 to 50 percent of the area of the tibial insertion, while the femoral insertion is closer to 70 percent of the tibial insertion. These results correspond with the results of our intraoperative measurements and of the data from our ACL randomized control trial that examined MRI data from the contralateral knee of 57 young participants. Variation is the key to life. Looking at the sagittal length of the ACL, we see it varies from 9 to 24 millimeters. Comparing the smallest ACLs to the largest, there is a three times difference in size, indicating significant variation. Arthroscopic examination requires cutting of the ACL remnant near the tibial insertion, revealing the distinct insertions of the bundles. Examination in young patients reveals different shapes, sizes, and bundle orientations, with a few patients even possessing a third intermediate bundle. Similarly, examination of the femoral insertion highlights the double bundle anatomy. An examination in young patients reveals that the femoral insertion displays variation with regards to its shape and size. To accommodate for this variation, we aim for 50 to 80 percent reconstructed area. Though this is not confirmed, we postulate that if less than 50 percent of the tibial insertion site is covered, there is an increased chance of graft failure. This measurement is easily performed with a simple arthroscopic ruler. Given the insertion site measurements, we are able to calculate the percentage of tibial insertion site reconstructed area for a given graph size. Using this table to calculate the percent reconstructed area, we determine intraoperatively the graph size that restores 50 to 80 percent of the measured tibial area. We must also understand age-related changes of the ACL. As our MRI studies have shown, the ACL undergoes degenerative changes with age. 
This could be a result of disuse or of natural fatty infiltration. We find that the peel bundle shows greatest change and MRI signal intensity with age. Dr. Savio Wu also showed that with age, the strength of the fibers greatly diminishes, as much as by 80%. Cadaveric studies help visualize this further, with the vascular fetal ACL maturing in the adult stages of life, while becoming weaker and more friable in late life. These findings have particular implications for biomechanic, anatomic, and histologic studies that aim to draw conclusions based on cadaveric models. Review of recent cadaveric studies shows a mean age well past peak ACL health. Our studies have recognized this limitation and have sought to include younger, healthy patients to avoid the pitfalls of natural aging on the integrity of the ACL. Such fragile anatomic studies lead to one-size-fits-all surgery. Histological examination helps reveal the insertions of direct and indirect fibers. Examination of fetal, porcine, and primate knees shows multiple zones at the ligament cartilage junction and intermingling of the direct and indirect fibers. Appreciation of the joint role of these fibers and anatomic reconstruction allows proper restoration of native knee kinematics. And thus we must understand the definition of anatomic reconstruction. Anatomic ACL reconstruction is a functional restoration of the ACL to its native dimensions, collagen orientation, and insertion sites according to individual anatomy. The double bundle concept applies this definition to allow for individualized anatomic reconstruction. The two bundles are a biologic phenomenon and will reform when ACL reconstruction is done properly. Again, the goal is to restore 50 to 80% of the tibial bundle insertion sites. This means selecting between quadriceps, BTB, hamstrings, and allografts, as well as paying attention to the meniscus, collateral ligaments, bony morphology, genetics, and return to sports. And though technique is okay, the principle is more important and can be applied for 100% ACL surgery. Smaller insertion sites may be better treated with single bundle ACL reconstruction. In such a patient, an 8.5 millimeter graft may restore 65% of the tibial insertion site. MRI at one year post-op reveals excellent graft healing with return to preoperative level of function, making this the optimal treatment for this patient. In a patient with a larger insertion site, a much larger double bundle is needed to restore 61% of the tibial insertion site. MRI at one year again shows excellent graft healing with return to preoperative level of function. In cases of one bundle tears, which has an incidence of approximately 5%, augmentation surgery may yield most optimal results. With PL bundle augmentation, reconstruction of the PL bundle restores native tension to the intact AM bundle. MRI at one year shows graft healing between the two bundles with restoration of native knee kinematics. Remnant preservation may be the way of the future. Remnant preservation techniques take advantage of the native matrices. Remnant preservation may improve graft incorporation, restoring 100% of the tibial insertion site, while also ensuring a richer neurovascular supply to the graft. Finally, though biologic and repair techniques are still being developed, they may be the way of the future. To illustrate this concept, we present a case. Conversion of a single bundle to a double bundle ACL reconstruction in a 20-year-old male with explosive instability. Preoperative measurement in this case suggested a tibial insertion site area of 134 millimeters squared. Percent reconstructed area calculation using these measurements predicted that a single bundle 10 millimeter graft provide 71% tibial coverage. However, intraoperative confirmation revealed a much larger tibial insertion site area of 179 mm squared. At two standard deviations above the mean insertion site area, this large insertion site was better suited to a double bundle 8 mm AM and 7 mm PL graft. To restore a similar 72% of the tibial insertion site, 
Had one year follow-up, this patient had no subjective instability, no residual pivot shift, and a plus one millimeter KT2000 side-to-side -side difference. On the opposite end of the spectrum, this patient elected for ACL reconstruction with hamstring autograft. However, three-dimensional MRI measurements revealed a small tibial insertion site, over two standard deviations below the mean size. Intra-op measurements corresponded with MRI measurements, finding a small tibial insertion site that supported reconstruction with a 6 mm single bundle, restoring 78% of the native tibial insertion site. At one year follow-up, MRI revealed native signal intensity, as well as restoration of normal hyperextension in the reconstructed knee. The patient had no subjective complaints and no residual instability. As mentioned earlier, literature has supported the use of larger than 8 mm grafts to decrease re-rupture rates. However, in this patient with a small native tibial insertion site, an 8 mm graft would have provided 128% restoration. Given the proximity of meniscal structures in the patient's small notch, it is likely that such a reconstruction may not have been optimal for this patient. Ultimately, close attention to her anatomy and respect for her native insertion site sizes allowed for an excellent outcome. This patient presented with a large 22 millimeter insertion site length. Arthroscopic examination confirmed a complete ACL rupture. Cutting of the tibial remnant showed the distinct insertions of the AM and PL bundles while visualization of the femoral side revealed a robust femoral remnant. After evaluating the tear pattern and anatomy for our 17-year-old patient, precise measurements are made over the tibial insertion site, notch dimensions, and femoral insertion to determine if the parameters are suitable for a single bundle or double bundle placement. Calculation of the tibial insertion site reconstructed area suggested that a double bundle with an 8.5 and 7.5 millimeter grafts would provide 61% coverage within our goal of 50 to 80%. Hamstring autograft was selected by the patient. Postoperative 3D CT allows us to evaluate tunnel position and reconstruct the area. As we can see, the patient received an anatomic double bundle with graft size and choice individualized to his particular needs restoring 61% of the tibial insertion site. At one year post-op, we can see excellent graft healing without residual instability. We must always remember that each patient is unique and we must account for individual variation. One size fits all surgery may capture the majority of patients. However, by adjusting for variation, we can capture the failures on the tail ends of the spectrum. We must also assess the fragility of our clinical studies. As compared to large, long-term studies like the Framingham studies, orthopedic sports studies largely rely on small sample sizes and short-term outcomes with poor outcome measures. Published papers on anatomic ACL reconstruction often lack details in the description of the surgical procedure, and there are large variations in anatomic ACL reconstruction techniques. Thus, we developed a validated checklist with the help of 34 ACL experts, over 900 orthopedic specialists from around the world, to be used for anatomic ACL reconstruction. We must understand the philosophy of, I want it there, will not actually result in anatomic tunnels. It is easy to place tunnels where we think they are anatomic, but without evaluation with CT, it is impossible to know. 3DCT is an invaluable tool in confirming tunnel placement and assessing the accuracy of our anatomic ACL reconstructions. Early level 1 and 2 studies comparing reconstruction techniques found that anatomic single and double bundle reconstruction techniques lead to comparable long-term outcomes and that both are superior to conventional non-anatomic techniques. Our ongoing NIH-funded randomized controlled trial hopes to further clarify the role of double bundle reconstruction, examining in vivo kinematics and clinical outcomes. With greater than 90% follow-up at three to five years, patients have experienced just three graft tears and four contralateral ACL injuries.
These cases highlight that the pivot shift is a multifactorial phenomenon. Here at the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Volker Musal and others are working to develop objective measurements to better understand these factors. Before moving towards an anterolateral tenodesis, the surgeon must assess the health of the ACL, ITB, capsule, menisci, and bony morphology. These are all integral pieces to the pivot shift puzzle and must be properly understood. Studies examining the biology of graft healing have shown that as the ACL graft revascularizes, it weakens, seen as increased MRI signal intensity. Murine models have shown that the ACL is weakest at six to eight weeks following ACL reconstruction. Our clinical findings suggest that the graft does not regain native signal intensity until one year post-op, as seen in this NHL player. Additional studies have found continued remodeling to two years postoperatively, indicating that healing takes time. In an effort to develop even more objective outcome measures, we have also implemented dynamic stereo x-ray, CT bone model tracking, and MRI to evaluate variables such as knee kinematics, ligament elongation, and cartilage contact pressures in detail. Our recent Porto award-winning study was able to overlay femoral tunnel area with contralateral native insertion site area, calculating percentage of reconstructed area. We found that the percent reconstructed area of the native ACL insertion site in anatomic ACL reconstruction is correlated with the closer to normal dynamic kinematics of the knee at 6 and 24 months and improved patient reported outcomes at 6 months postoperatively. Studies examining cartilage thickness using research-grade 3 Tesla MRI showed that non-anatomic tunnel placement reduces cartilage thickness in comparison to anatomic ACL reconstruction. While success for return to sport is one variable to assess outcomes, an even greater outcome is long-term knee health. We need advanced imaging techniques to help determine the value and quality of our procedures in restoring natural knee kinematics for long-term knee health. Similarly, quantitative MRI studies that allowed us to examine cartilage morphology and structure, indicative of cartilage thickness and quality, found that two years postoperatively, knees with anatomic ACL reconstructions had less cartilage change than knees with non-anatomic ACL reconstructions. Together, these findings beg the question, does improved restoration of native knee kinematics protect against the development of osteoarthritis? Ultimately, medicine is an art. It is based on scientific principles. We must learn to work with nature, and we must be critical in understanding our outcome measurements. Different treatment options are constantly being added to our therapeutic arsenal. We should be aware that these treatment trends come and go our main goal should always be to elect the best treatment for our patients, being cautious not to be influenced by unproven novel technologies or promising new techniques before reliable, independent research is done. Thus, the driving mantra for all surgeons must be anatomy. If we can understand and respect anatomy wholly, we realize that the only solution is to restore nature. As president of the World Bank, Jim Young Kim once said, we are making the same mistake in global healthcare that we make in the American system, believing that better diagnostics and therapeutic tools will solve all problems. They won't, they haven't, we don't measure results well enough. Of course, this work would not have been possible without the tireless efforts and collaboration of those who contribute themselves to scientific growth and understanding.
Thank you. And remember, learning is forever for better patient care.